We do a lot of work with large corporations and typically involve a variety of stakeholders, not only the technology folks, the legal, the compliance, the risk, the records manager, and the business units. We oftentimes use the paradigm um, of generative AI as, as a smart intern. You know, we got somebody who's a subject matter expert. Um, they work really hard. They That's work right. all the time. That's right. Um, they're good at this. And, and they're also extremely well polished. You know, you ask them to write something and, and, and they sound really intelligent. Now, like any intern, they're also very naive. They're easily fooled and, and, and sometimes they get well ahead of themselves. And so when we talk about using generative AI today, we say, what would you use for an intern? And, and back to some of the comments, whether we want a human supervisor to supervise our, our, our generative AI or even having interns looking at interns. Um, but the level of trust we can do today is to what extent will we let our smart, savvy, well-spoken, but sometimes very naive intern do a critical task. And Mark, Jen, I can, I can, I can uh, oh. chime in there. That's very much what we try to teach at a university level. Exactly that same reason, because it is like that smart intern, right? I, I've got a, a university student and we're trying to get them to realize that they're still naive about the business world, that they can find all this stuff through AI, but you need to talk to somebody with domain expertise. You may need to talk to a lawyer. You may need to talk to somebody who, who knows that field to recognize, as, as Eric has said several times, it's probabilistic, right? You don't bake your career on it. <laughs> and William, you're going to add to that. So uh, Gen AI can be very, uh, very confident in, in what it what it produces uh, well beyond the confidence level that it should be at. But I like to take a different approach. I like I like it when my enterprise uh, clients will allow me to look at the list of initiatives coming up and everywhere I see BI, which is just about everywhere, we think about AI instead. And I ask, I drill in and I ask, okay, what do you, what do you want the BI for? What are you getting at? And many times I find when I ask questions that way, uh, we get to things that AI can do or help with. And so I like it when AI is in the picture when there's a commitment to it, and we're actually looking for ways to bring this discipline into our organization because we know it's a keeper, and we know we have to get good with AI in order to be sustainable as an organization. And so when you take that approach, you start looking at it at almost the default. You're going to find ways to use Gen AI. So when it comes to automating, automating risk, um, and, and I alluded this a little bit earlier of having the interns looking at the interns. How can we use generative AI to sort of solve the problems of generative AI? I mean, how can we use it to help identify vulnerabilities and what areas are you seeing organizations doing that? Uh, actually, you know, one of the things that I would, what I would say is let's, let's stop hyper-focusing on generative AI as AI and, and, you know, you, you know, we shouldn't be hypnotized by that as being the the sole solution. There are lots of more traditional AI techniques. And it's funny for me to say that because it's like, you know, AI has been around since the 50s. So it's not like this is something that just popped up over the last couple of years. And there's a lot of, you know, more traditional techniques, machine learning, artificial intelligence that can be integrated into, you know, a service architecture that, that you could configure to help in scanning content and parsing out, you know, rel relative things that are that are important in, with respect to risk management or compliance, like, you know, entity recognition or locations or sentiment of content or relevance of, of most of these things that, that are within the business context that can then help uh, provide again, that human in the loop to provide some, some oversight as to, as to where you, you can adequately build a more comprehensive AI machine learning architecture supporting uh, uh, risk management. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember um, I spent years in the risk world, and and frankly, I was always surprised at how siloed governance, risk management, and compliance are. Especially with, with yeah, in security, they're all doing the same thing. They're all supposed to be focused on governing access to information or systems or processes. So it really should have been all in one from way back when. We just didn't really have the the technology or even the bureaucratic capability to pull that off in organizations. So you wind up with these silos. And what I saw 10, 15 years ago, or at least 10 years ago, was Python being used to reach into different systems across the organization and then deliver some sort of signal as to what's happening out there. Well, now with generative AI, depending upon what you want to give it access to, and to David's point, even more traditional AI, 
there are excellent ways that you can get a, a strategic view of what's happening in the organization, even just from the network, for example. Network behavior in and of itself is a tremendous resource to show what's happening. And when you see some of these hacks, I mean, the snowflake hack, when the feds came out a year later, said, oh, yeah, by the way, all you guys got hacked. I'm like, a year later, you tell us this? What's going on there? Point being, I think this new generation of AI, if you give it access, and you have to be careful about what you give it access to, and if you focus way upstream, we're talking about data lifecycle management, if you have a streaming architecture, you've got a filter on that sucker way upstream, you're going to catch all kind of stuff that would have taken you forever to find that is tremendously powerful in operational risk, in fraud detection, in anomaly detection, all these different things. So there are new ways of doing these things that are going to tackle some of these siloed disasters, quite frankly, because you do not want these big, tall silos around governance, risk management, compliance, and security. So let me let me do a following question to that. To what extent, if I'm gonna I'm gonna use my analogy, continue my analogy, if I'm gonna teach my intern to look at you know uh, all of these uh, business operations and transactions, mm -hmm. including a lot of sensitive data, I can teach my intern to say, hey, that doesn't look right, and to be able to alert alert that. How about from a data provenance or a data security classification perspective? Do I ever worry that my intern is going to go back my generative AI and blab, um, you know, through through uh, feeding it to, to some tar type of large language model to say, oh, we, we've actually inadvertently exposed this information sure. out there? How do we protect against that? Well, it's either in your RAG model or it's fine tuning. I think RAG model is probably going to be more effective because fine tuning is some is some pretty complex stuff. But yeah, you want to be watching for PII. You got. I think the good news probably is that you should not need to expose it to PII in order to get the signal that you're looking for. What you're really looking for is behavioral analytics. How are systems behaving right now, absent any awareness of specific PII? So if you set your architecture up right, or that's a separate domain to which the, the AI does not have access, then you're doing okay, but you do have to set it up properly and and be wary of that. I mean, this I think it's a clarion call for organizations to really do a brass tax assessment of what their information landscape looks like, where the systems are, where that PII is. There are a number of vendors that are cropping up in that space right now. Data catalog vendors were, I think, one of the first to to focus on that. But you've got to have some realistic view of what systems you have who's talking to whom, where, when, how, and why, and so forth. But then if you're careful about it, I don't think you need to touch the PII in order to get the signal that you're looking for. Although, Eric, I like what you're saying, but I'm going to expand it beyond PII. It's, it's, it's all types of sensitive information, corporate confidential, trade secrets, other information. Uh, and to some extent, PII, I'm going to argue, is the easy, it is the easy yeah. test, because a lot of times <laughs> it follows the regular expressions. But uh, you know, if I got a bunch of developers developing a new technology that I expose, so do, do I have to worry about my intern blabbing about that out there? So, so I, let me, let me give you like a, a practical example of that. And this is from, from a project I worked on literally 25 years ago. It was, uh, it was a, an attempt to do, you know, what, what today we, or what then we would call competitive intelligence through scanning and extracting data from websites and being able to to recreate, you know, essentially what, what this project did is it, you know, it had a, a particular target and they, uh, they, the company that was the target, they published all sorts of information about, about who their staff was and where they were, what office they were in and what's the, you know, how to get in touch with them. And basically what, what, what the client did here was they, they, they pulled all that information and they were able to fuse it together to, to actually derive the entire map of of of, of the office uh, uh, layout, and then they were able to, you know, based on other information that they were able to get, such as articles or papers that were being published, to be able to determine, you know, who talks to who and who's working with who and how they work together. Because we know that these two people published a research paper, and their offices are right next door to each other. And so, so essentially, you know, when Mark, when you refer to to sensitive information, and that's an example of sensitive information that a company might not want to be, you know, broadcasting to, to the public or to their competitors, more likely, you know, who, who they're, you know, who's on their team and what they're actually doing. So now, you know, ratchet this up to today where, where there's massive amounts of, of information that is extractable from the, you know, what is, what is publicly available. 
And because, you know, exactly as what Eric, Eric is saying, this is probabilistic. And so I might you know, make a decision that we're not going to put such and such information in this article and this blog on our corporate website. And then somebody else who's overseeing, you know, publication of content is going to say the same thing, except for another blog on another part of another, you know, another, you know, subsidiary of the same, same holding corporation. And now all of a sudden I'm, I, as a competitor, I'm taking all your content and I'm dumping into my, my uh, generative AI and I'm using that to, to fill in the blanks where, okay, well, I got two different articles here and they both were, were, were redacted from publishing a piece of information, but I got enough content to be able to predict where those, where that, where that stuff should go. And so, so, you know, we talk about risk management, you know, you know, you have to not just think about, you know, you know, a PII, you know, like, like we're, we're obsessed with PII because that's what's in the news, but there's so much more sensitive content. And we have to think in terms of, you know, what's our, what are our, what are our competitors doing and how are they going to make use of this so that we're actually monitoring, you know, the, the, because there it's not a compliance risk there. It's a, it's intellectual property or it's, or it's sensitive information or it's the, you know, the, the secret ingredients to the, the Colonel's fried chicken or, you know, Coca-Cola recipe. Yeah. Those are the types of things that, you know, that's, that is, that's, you know, that's the corporate, corporate secret sauce.